Isaiah 62. And we're going to begin our reading at verse number one. I'm going to read from the NIV, the New International Version. Feel free to read along with whatever you have available to you there, or you can read with us on the screen. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all the kings your glory. I want you to notice this. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. It will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hands, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. For the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. I want to minister with the help of the Lord for a few moments from the subject, a new name. A new name. I've always been intrigued by the idea of the Witness Protection Program. I've always wondered how these people felt who were a part of it. Because if you think about it, a good percentage of the people who are placed in this witness protection have some kind of guilty association with dangerous criminals. But because they cooperate with authorities and turn over state's evidence, they get immunity. And the government arranges a new life, a new home, a new job, and a new identity for them. A fresh start, so to speak. They are free from all the chains of the past. And they can start life anew. Most of the people who enter the program are successful in building a new life for themselves. But there are some who just can't seem to escape their old life. They can't let go of their old friends. They can't stay away from the old way. They can't give up the old habits. And they keep going back again and again. They have a new life and a new identity. But they still see themselves as connected to what they used to be. I heard of a tragic story of a young woman. Her name was Brenda. She had witnessed some very violent crimes when she was involved with a street gang. She testified and was placed in the program, but she couldn't let go of her past. She kept calling her old friends, the ones who were with her in that gang. She even invited a few of them to come visit her in her new home, which defeats the entire purpose of this program. These so-called friends talked her into going back with them for a visit, she got in the car with them, and as the story read, she was never seen alive again. Such a tragedy. But that's the grip, oftentimes, that the past has on people, especially in a spiritual sense. God has promised his people a new life with a new name and a clean break from the past. But sometimes we have a hard time letting go. So today I want to talk to you about a new name. Because in Christ Jesus, we are free from the past. I'll say that again. In Christ Jesus, we are free from the past. The good news of the gospel is that the past does not equal the future. That tomorrow does not have to look like yesterday. What's interesting to me is that this theme runs throughout the entire scripture. Throughout all your Bible. God says in some way or form, I will forgive you. I'll redeem you. I'll make you new. Through the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 36 and 26, he says this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. 
I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Not too long ago, we celebrated the new year. And I'm here to tell somebody that today, you have the possibility of celebrating the new you. You don't have to begin this new year with the old you still hanging on. Because we serve a God who says in Revelation 21 and 5, Behold, I make all things new. I said that my Bible says that there's a God in heaven that can make all things new. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what your past is telling you that you are in Christ Jesus, that he can give you a new life, a new name. He makes all things new. So today I want to look at a chapter in Isaiah which talks about breaking free from the past, and that God has promised to give us a new name. This is a promise that he made thousands of years ago. It's a promise that is still true today for anyone who calls upon his name. And it can be true for you and I starting today if we want to. We read in Isaiah 62, very powerful, powerful passage. And I want us to just focus today on three spiritual truths that I believe are found in this passage. First of all, it promises, number one, that God will change the name that the past has put on you. Do you remember how it was when we were kids and the way we would talk to each other on the playground? How many of you know that kids can be pretty mean? Somebody's thinking adults can too. But that's another message for another time. Kids can actually be pretty, pretty mean. Even to those who are supposedly their friends. They'll make up terrible nicknames. And I know that this is a sore subject for some because some of you have been trying to live down that nickname for so long. And many times... Those nicknames will follow you all throughout your life. We got relatives that we don't even know their first name. I need some help. If you got that in your family, raise your hand. A lot, I, I do. A lot of us do. There's people in our neighborhood that we don't even know their last name. But we just know their nickname. And that's unfortunately how kids can be. Kids can zero in on any defect they see. And label you with it. If you are different than anyone else in any other way, they'll come up with a special name for you and won't let you forget it. Can I tell you, the past is the same way. In fact, it's worse than any mean-spirited school kid. The past will put a label on you based on something it has seen in you. And if, that, it's just, and if it's true enough to, 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 to be, for you to believe it, it can be on you possibly for the rest of your life. If you let that label from the past take a hold of who you are, it can hold you back from the future that God has planned for you. There's a really great song by a Christian artist named Matthew West. It's called, Hello, My Name Is. And that song, the words, the lyrics of that song are very powerful. He says, hello, my name is regret. I'm pretty sure we have met. Every single day of your life, I'm the whisper inside that won't let you forget. Hello, my name is defeat. I know you recognize me. Just when you think you can win, I, dra I drag you right back down again till you've lost all belief. Song goes on to say, these are the voices. These are the lies. I have believed them for the very last time. And the last portion of the song starts out like this. Hello, my name is child of the one true king. I believe this songwriter took the words right out of Isaiah's mouth 
Because in verse number two of Isaiah 62, he says, you will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. And then in verse number four, he goes on to say, no longer will they call you deserted or no longer will your land be desolate, but you will be called Hesba, which means my delight is in her and your land Beulah, which literally means married for the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be merry. He said, Jerusalem, I know you've been through a lot. Jerusalem, I know you've struggled and the land looks desolate and things look destroyed. But can I tell you, I'm giving you a new name. You will no longer be deserted. You will no longer be desolate. But I'm going to call you my delight. And more than that, I'm going to marry you and your land will be taken care of. I've come to tell somebody I don't care what people have called you. I don't care what you've called yourself. I don't care what the devil's been throwing out against you. God is here to give you a new name. You don't have to be where you come from. You can be what God desires you to be. What label has been put on you today? What name did you bring with you today? Maybe on somebody there's a label of sinner or maybe the label of failure. Maybe you're carrying the label of disappointment because people have told you that you're such a disappointment. Maybe you're carrying the label of confused because it seems like in every part of your life you're confused about what to do next. Maybe your label you're carrying is unmotivated. Because you just can't seem to motivate yourself to do and be what God desires you to do and be. Maybe the label on you is addicted. You're addicted to something that you feel has its grip so strong in your life that you will never be free. Maybe the label on you is angry. You're just known as that angry person. Or maybe hurt. You've been hurt so bad by so many people that you can't even see your life outside of that hurt and that pain. Can I tell you that we've all been attached to some kind of label? And maybe even in some cases, we've got to be honest, maybe we've earned it. But today, God is saying, I want to call you by a new name. He's saying, I want to call you my delight. I want to call you my precious bride. All Israel had was a land. The walls had been destroyed. The temple had been destroyed. Israel was scattered about. And God says, I don't see you the way you see yourself. I know you see yourself as deserted. I know you see yourself as desolate. But I'm here to tell you, Israel, you're my delight. I know no one wants to be with somebody that's all messed up. I know no one wants to be with somebody that has nothing to offer them. But God says, although you have nothing to offer me I have so much to offer you and so you're my bride you're my special love and so you are not desolate and look at what he says in verse number 12 Isaiah goes on to say they they means you they will be called the holy people <laughs> the redeemed of the Lord and you will be called sought after the city no longer deserted you got to understand these are people that were weeping over the past they remember the state of former glory in Jerusalem they remember the beauty of its walls and in those days a city was identified by its walls. So you tear down the walls, they had no identity. You tear down the homes that for many of them, their ancestors had lived and built, and now they were living them and they were destroyed. 
Many were taken captives. Others ran and scattered all over the place, finding refuge. The land is desolate, nothing to offer. And God looks at them and says, you will be called holy people. You will be the redeemed of the Lord. You will be sought after a city that is no longer deserted. Can I tell you whatever name you think you have earned for yourself, I'm telling you that God has given you a new name. One that defines not where you've been, neither where you are, but a name that defines where you are going. You're saying, Pastor, how is it that I'm going to be holy? Look at my life right now. God says, you're holy. I know you don't feel it now. I know you don't see it now. But when I'm done working in your life, you're going to be holy. I'm going to redeem you. You're going to be sought after. You're going to have an identity. God changed the name of Abram in our Bible to Abraham. Because Abraham means father of many. And God promised him in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, I will make you into a great nation. Verse 3, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. His new name defined his new identity. God has this funny way of speaking into your life and showing you what you can be. Before you can even see it. Here's an elderly man and his wife that had no children, no descendant, no heir. And with the current possibility of his wife ever being able to have children. And God says, I'm going to change your name from Abram to Abraham. Now imagine Abraham filling out a job application. And writing his name, Abraham Father of many nations. And then the next line, how many children do you have? Zero. How can you be the father of many nations with no children? God, that's not funny. You're telling me that I'm going to be a holy people and my mind is all over the place. You're telling me that I'm going to be redeemed when I'm addicted to this thing. You're telling me that I'm going to be sought after when everybody has left me? That's not funny, God. That's not a cute joke. God says, no, no, no. That's not a joke. It's your new identity. Because God doesn't see where you are. God sees where you're going. And he wants to put a new identity and a new name on somebody before we leave this service here today. There's a God in this place that can set you free from whatever has its grips in your life. There's a God in this place that can redirect your life. His new name defined his new identity. Jesus had an impulsive, emotional disciple named Simon. And he changed his name to Peter which means rock. His new name defined his new identity. Can I tell you that God has given you a new name to match your new identity? You are his bride. You're his beloved. You're his son, his daughter, his friend. You are his called one, his ambassador, his representative. His delight, the apple of his eye. I'm telling you that whatever name the past has put on you, today you can cross that out. You can forget it forever because in Christ Jesus, you can have a new name. You can have a new name before you leave here today. Your new name can be delivered. Your new name can be saved. Your new name can be healed. Your new name can be restored. 
Your new name can be blessed. Your new name can be anointed. Or more importantly, son of God, daughter of the king. I don't care what you came carrying in here to this service here today. I don't care what people told you you were going to be. I'm here to tell you that God can give you a new name. If you believe that, could you throw your hands in the air and give them praise right now? Come on. I need somebody that's been given a new name in this house. I need somebody to help me lift up the name of Jesus that says, Pastor, I know what it's like to have to try to live up and live away from that past label, but God's given me a new name. God's given me a new identity. I'm his son. I'm his daughter. I have a new name. Friend that's visiting here today, you can have a new name. It's declared over your life when you go down in the waters of baptism in the mighty name of Jesus. That name washes away your sins. That name gives you a new life. That name gives you the access to eternity. You can have a new name. I'm not where I come from. I'm not where I used to be. I'm a son of the Most High God. You're a daughter of the King. It's time to get a hold of your new name. You have a new name. Which leads me to the next thing I want you to see. God will change the name that the past has put on you. Number two, God will give you a future worthy of your name. The Bible makes it clear what God has wanted for his people all along. His desire is that we become like him. That we love others like he loved. That we forgive others And that we help others just like Jesus did when he walked on this earth. That we treat others with Christ-like compassion. In other words, God wants us to be more like him. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, the apostle Paul writes and says, For those God foreknew, speaking of you and I, the church, he also predestined, to be conformed to the image. Another translation says the likeness of his son. In other words, he wants us to be just like him. Another powerful quality, we mentioned it briefly. He also says in the, both the Old and the New Testament. We find a rendering of it in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. And it says, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I love this because he says, you shall be. Because someone's thinking, I'm not holy. Look at the things that I did this past week. Look at the thoughts that I have. The issues that I'm still trying to get through. The junk that's been attached to my life for so long. And you're telling me, Pastor, that God sees me as holy? He says, you shall be. How many of you know we're not there yet? As a pastor, I get concerned with people that think they're already there. I say, well, maybe you should come up here to this pulpit because I'm not there as your pastor. He's still working on me. But I've got a promise that in my name, in my identity, God can make me holy. That I'm not as holy as I should be, 
but all I have to do is look back over my life and see how far God's brought me from and realize he's making me holy I'm not where I used to be but I'm also in process God is making me more like him what am I trying to say let me give you the next thing God gives you a new name and then he gives you the power to live up to it on your own you can't be holy I don't care what legalistic doctrines people try to preach, but you will never make yourself holy. There's nothing you and I can do to make ourselves holy. He's the one that makes us holy. It's his nature. It's everything that he is. He's a holy God. He's a blameless God. He's a righteous God. And he's calling me to be like him. And the only way that I can be like him is with his help. I can never make myself holy enough. And so he makes us holy through his spirit, through, the, through his word. The Lord told his disciples, you've been cleansed by the word that I speak. And so the word cleanses us. I can't cleanse myself. The word cleanses me. I can't keep myself clean. The blood of Jesus that washed me continues to wash me and make me clean. I don't have the power in myself to do what I'm supposed to do. But thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for his word. Thank God for the church that is working with me to help me become more like him. This is an important distinction to understand. That when God tells you that you are his beloved and that you have been made holy, that you have the potential to live a godly life, it's not just meaningless flattery. It's true. Because this is what God sees us becoming. He sees your potential. And it is his stated purpose to get you and I there. The scripture says it's, it's his desire to present a church at the end of this age without spot, without wrinkle, and without blemish. That that's the Lord Jesus Christ's ultimate goal, to pre be able to present a holy church when this age ends. But it's God's work. It's God that does it. Let me ask you a question. How do you get a wrinkle out? Ironing. Hot steam. How do you get a spot out? You got to scrub it. And that's why some of us have been feeling a little bit of pressure late. And God's been putting us through process and putting us through the fire. And we feel God scrubbing at us a little bit. What's going on? And I don't know what's happening. God says, before this thing is over, I'm presenting you as holy. I'm presenting you as godly. I'm presenting you as, oh, you're not there yet. But when I get done with you, you're going to be a holy church. You're going to be a blameless church. You're going to be a church without spotter. So if you're not there yet, that's okay. I'm not there yet either. But God's going to give us the power. God's going to give us the ability through his spirit and through his word to be the church he's called us to be. I hope I'm helping somebody here today. Look at somebody real quick and tell them, it's okay, I'm not there yet either. God said this about Jerusalem. And it's also true about you and I. Isaiah 62, verse number one, he says, for Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like the dawn. I love this. Because you got to understand what this language means. That's why I use the NIV because the King James, it sounds kind of poetic, but it doesn't make any sense. But I don't give that excuse to people. Pastor, I would read my Bible, but it doesn't make any sense. Find a version that does make sense. Oh, I lost some amens. That's okay. 
Because we just want an excuse for being lazy. Pastor, you know, I started reading the Bible January 1st, but I just didn't understand it, so I just stopped. Go find another translation. Because the NIV says, for Jerusalem's sake, they're desolate, all right? There's nothing. There's no stone on top of a stone. He says, for their sake, I'm not going to be quiet. Quiet what? Telling them, you're mine. I love you. You're my delight. You're my beloved. I'm married to you. I know you ain't got nothing right now, but, but I'm married. And I'm not going to keep quiet about it. I'm going to tell everybody that I have to tell. I'm going to put it on Facebook. I'm going to put it on Instagram. I'm going to let everybody know you're mine. Oh, I wish somebody would rejoice with me today because God does not stop being quiet about how much he loves me, about how I'm his. I don't always act the way that I should act. I don't always do the things that I should, but he's not quiet about how he feels about me. Oh, I wish somebody would rejoice with me. Uh, I wish I had some real folks in the building uh, that say, I don't deserve his love. Uh, I don't deserve his goodness, but he's madly in love with me. Uh, he's passionate about me. Uh, he won't stop talking about me, and I've got nothing to give him. <sighs> he says, for Jerusalem's sake. He's saying, I'm not doing it for anybody else but Jerusalem. I want Jerusalem to know. And so I'm not going to be quiet until her righteousness shines out like the dawn. Until her salvation is like a blazing torch. Verse 3, he says, you will be. You're not right now, but you will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand. A royal diadem in the hand of your God. He says, you're not that right now, but you will be. And God says, I'm going to say it until you believe it. I'm not going to be quiet about it. I'm going to say it until your righteousness shines forth. I'm going to say it because you will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand. A royal diadem in the hand of your God. And then in verse number 12, he says, you will be called. You're not there yet, but you will be called. Sought after the city no longer desired. Israel looked like nothing. And now the world is upset today and wants her land. And whenever anything happens in the Middle East, the royal diadem begins to shine. And now everybody wants that land. They're attacking Israel. Why? Because she's no longer the desolate. She's the sought after one. There's an entire part of the world that wants to eliminate her because she's the sought after one. Oh, she wasn't like that before. She was desolate. She had nothing to offer. And now the whole Middle East wants to take what rightfully belongs to Israel. Why? Because God fulfilled his word. And now Israel's righteousness shines like the dawn. God is saying, even if today you're not quite there, this is who you can be. This is what can happen in your life. One of the great things about life in God is that our sins are forgiven. Freely, completely, and absolutely. Your sins are forgiven not just once, but again and again and again through the blood of Jesus. If there is a sinful habit that you struggle with, you can be sure that every time you fail and every time you go to God for forgiveness, he will forgive you through the power of his blood. You know why I'm preaching like this? Because there's sons and daughters of the king in this building 
that are not living and seeing themselves the way God wants you to see because you've got some issues in your life you've got some things hidden that no one knows of but if you take it to the Lord and you ask God to forgive you let his blood wash you you can be what you're supposed to be he can give you that new name and if you haven't been forgiven it's wonderful and it's an amazing thing friend you can give your life to Jesus being baptized in his name and have your sins washed away forever you don't have to carry the identity you've been carrying you don't have to carry the name that you've been carrying. Jesus can wash you. Jesus can cleanse you. I heard a story of a preacher who was preaching a crusade. And he personally shared the story with me. He said he was preaching a, a crusade. And he was just preaching about the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood. The blood to wash you. The blood to cleanse you. And the Holy Ghost was moving and God was touching. And he said the following. He said, I don't care if you're an axe murderer. The blood of Jesus can wash you. And he kept on preaching. Well, the altar call came. And a gentleman walked up to the altar. And he said, I'm the one you were talking about. He said, what do you mean? He said, I just finished doing 30 years in prison for killing my neighbor with an axe. He said, do you really think that God can forgive me? He said, oh, yeah. He laid his hands on that axe murderer. And Jesus filled him with a gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. And that same night, he went down in the waters of baptism in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you find yourself today. There's a God in this place that can give you a new name. His forgiveness is available to all. His sons and his daughters and those that still have yet to give their life to Jesus. His forgiveness is available to you. And I will tell you what's even more wonderful. When you ultimately get victory over that sin that has haunted you for months or years or even decades. Believe me, there are areas of my life that without a doubt God's working on. But it's a wonderful thing to look back and see how God has given me victory in areas where before I thought I could never overcome. And I love what he goes on to say in Isaiah 62, 8 and 9. Again, God's not quiet about it. God is stating this to Israel, to Jerusalem, to Zion until they understand what he's saying. And he says, look, verse number 8, this is powerful. In Isaiah 62, the Lord has sworn... By his right hand and by his mighty army, never again. Somebody say never again. Well, I give your grain as food for your enemies. And never again. Someone say never again. Will foreigners drink the new wine for which you have toiled? But those who harvest it will eat it and praise the Lord. And those who gather the grapes will drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. What does this mean? I'm so glad you asked. Give me the next thing. God promises to lead his people ultimately to the land of never again. God says, when I'm done with you, I'm going to take you to the land of never again. What does that mean, preacher? Never again will you have to take a drink. Never again will you have to get high. Never again will you have to go back to the streets. Never again are you going to end up in prison. Never again will you make a failure of your life. I'm going to take you to a land of never again. I need some help here today. Is there anybody in this building that said after Jesus got a hold of me, he took me to the land of never again. Never again did I go to the club. Never again did I go sleep around. Never again did I go back to my former life because when God got done with me, he took me to the land of never Oh, I feel like preaching this to somebody here today that 
keeps tripping up, that keeps falling, that keeps making mistakes, that keeps going back to your past. Let God take you to the land of never again. Never again. God says, never again. Are you going to have to go back there? Never again. Are you going to need those things that you thought you couldn't live without? That's the kind of God that we serve. I almost t- entitled this message, the land of never again. Because God wants to take you there. If you allow him to. Someone's got to let go of the past. And let God take us to this new land. But preacher, I don't know what it's like to live without this. When you get Jesus in your life and he becomes the center of everything that you do and everything that you are. You'll never go back to those things. And when Jesus fully delivers you, you even get embarrassed thinking about what you used to do. You even get embarrassed and ashamed. Why? Because you're in a new land now. And you yourself begin to say, I'll never do that again. Hey, primo, you want to come? Never again. Have you gone back to the old neighborhood? Never again. Why? He delivered me from that. I've got a new identity. I've got a new name. Somebody shout never again. Maybe for years you have felt like the enemy's devouring all your crops. That the harder you try, the more you fail. Maybe for years you've believed your your name is failure and defeat and regret and sorrow. But God has given you a new name and he's leading you to a new land. The land of never again. Where you will experience the power of the Holy Ghost. Work in you and the fullness of God's potential in him. He says the righteousness will shine like the dawn. Your salvation will be a blazing torch and you will be a crown of splendor in God's hands and you will be called the redeemed of the Lord. You will be sought after, no longer rejected, no longer despised, no longer overlooked, no longer set aside. You will be called God's favored one. God's declarations over you are not just compliments to cover up your inadequacies. God's declarations over you are truth and power. He says that in him we are more than conquerors. We don't have to go through life defeated anymore. He sees our potential. It's real. It's not made up. It can lead you to the land of never again. Are you ready to go to that land today? Is there somebody in this building that says, Pastor, I want to go to that land? The land of never again. Isaiah 62 tells us how to get there. And I love this verse. I actually love this whole chapter, but, but these two verses here are just so powerful. Verses 6 and 7. Look at what he says. He says, you who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. And give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem. And makes her the praise of the earth. God doesn't rest telling us who we are. Forgiving our sins. Declaring who we can become. And he says, and so when I start to work in your life, then what needs to happen is that you call on to me and don't rest. You cry out to me and don't give up. What am I trying to say? The third and final thing. You have to refuse to settle for anything less than all that God has promised you. He says, when I begin to work in your life, I want you to call on me. And I don't want you to rest. In other words, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. 
until I establish you and make you what I've called you to be. In other words, I call out to him and I don't see the change yet, but I don't rest. I keep crying out to him. I keep reaching for him. And maybe things aren't going the way that I thought, but you don't give up until he establishes you. Until he makes you what he's called you to be. Pianist, if he would come. And until you get there, don't stop expecting it. Don't stop asking God for it. Don't stop thanking God for what he's about to do in your life. Because neither can we use that as an excuse. Well, pastor, I'm not there yet. Well, at least are you on your way? Because someone's like, see, I'm not there yet. So I'm still mean and angry and negative. At least get on your way, brother and sister. We're not there, but neither can you should you be there. Don't use that as an excuse, apostolic. Well, I'm not there yet, Pastor. That's why I cuss a little. Well, I'm not there yet, Pastor. That's why I smoke a little and drink a little. Get on your way, my dear brother and sister. And until he makes you, then that was, give me that scripture again, verse six and seven. Until he establishes you, until he makes you, what do you do? You don't rest. In what? In my prayers, in my fasting, in my devotion, in my church attendance, in my service, in my connection with other believers. I'm not going to rest. I'm not going to stop loving God. I'm not going to stop reading his word. I'm not going to stop praying. I'm not going to stop calling out to him until he establishes me and makes me. Because there's something that God does. And there's something that you must do. Don't settle for anything less. And I'm choosing my words carefully here because I don't want to give the impression that in our prayer life we start bossing God around. But he has told us clearly in his word, as plain as he could possibly say it, don't give up. Keep your requests before the throne. Day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute, second after second. I love that phrase. Give him no rest. That's God that's saying it. You know what God is saying? Don't stop bugging me. You know, God is busy, Pastor. Don't stop bugging him. Remind him every day of the promises that he's made to you. Remind him every day. My family still needs you, Jesus. My loved ones still need to be saved, Jesus. I'm not there yet, Jesus. Keep working on me. Keep molding me. Keep preparing. Don't give him any rest. How can I explain this to you? Let me try this. It reminds me of my children. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. If I promise them something, they give him no rest. Am I making sense now? That's how God wants you and I to be. So guys, we can't, we can't go to Chick-fil-A today. We'll go tomorrow. Ooh, Malachi starts the countdown. 24 hours and counting. Daddy, yes, Malachi. You said we're going to Chick-fil-A today. I know, I just, oh, God, I'm so busy. But Daddy, you said yesterday that we were going today. And that little boy, man, he'll be on me like white on rice until we drive through that drive through at Chick-fil-A. That's what God says. I want my children to be like that with me. Oh, do I got any sons and daughters of the king in this building that got some prayer requests that got some needs that want to take a hold of some of these promises that we've declared in this message here today God says you have my permission to not give me any rest until I establish you until I make you 
remind him again and again. Stand with me today. Lord, you said in your word. That's how I pray. I don't know how you pray, but that's how I pray. Lord, you said in your word, by your stripes, we are healed. So I'm believing you to heal me. Lord, you said in your word, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me in judgment, you're going to condemn God. It's in your word that no weapon's going to harm me and no lying tongue is going to pull me down. Your word says, and when you pray that way, you're reminding God of every promise he made in his word to you. Let me help somebody as I close. God has promised us a new name today and an abundance of blessings tomorrow. Let me help you. Right there as you're standing and I'm done. How do we get out of the past? Give me the last one, please. How do we get out of the past and into the future? Watch this. By living the present in his presence. So how do I get out of the past that I've lived for so long and go to the land of never again and go to this wonderful future preacher that you've been preaching about this whole message? How do I get that? you got to live the present in his presence. Isaiah said through the word of the Lord, give him no rest. I'm going to pray until it happens. I'm going to declare it over my family until the change comes. I'm going to declare the healing over my body until that sickness leaves. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to declare it. I'm going to give God no rest until all my children are in the house of God. I'm not going to give him no rest until my nephews and nieces and cousins and, and relatives are baptized in Jesus. I'm not going to give him no... I'm going to live in his presence until he performs what he's promised me. And so I want to see if there's some bold people in this room that say, preacher, I want that new name over my life. I'm done with the past. I don't care how big it is. I don't care how small it is. But I'm done with my life tethered to the past. I want to get a hold of this glorious promise that God has for me. If that's you, I want you to come and stand at this altar right now. Come, 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 come. I, I want that new name. I want that new identity over my life. Come on, come on, come on. No one's going to ask you what it is. No one's going to ask you what you've done. You know and God knows. But today he's ready to break you free from whatever's held you back. Come on, come on, come on.